Thank you everyone for inviting me um, to speak at this very important event. Thank you for organizing um, this initiative and this platform. The summit is especially critical in this very difficult time that's taking place in the Gaza Strip. Um, as you mentioned, Gaborg, I've been um, working in Palestine approximately for the last 10 years. And so while I'm not Palestinian myself, I've been privileged to have an intimate view of the healthcare system uh, over the last decade, and then particularly over the last two months or 70 days now since October 7th. So um, with that perspective, I'm here today to elevate the voices of the children of Gaza. I hope to do them justice um, with this presentation today and happy to take any questions afterwards. Um, and I always like to preface my talks with the fact that I speak as a physician, as an oncologist. Uh, I'm not a politician and um what I present today is not based on any political views, but rather just what I've seen and what I've worked with and on on the ground um, in Palestine again over the last many years. So thank you. So I titled this an acute on chronic crisis. And the reason for that is that the healthcare system in the Gaza Strip has been under extreme duress for many, many years. Um, and I would like to start just with a brief map to give everyone a context and a background to what Palestine looks like in general. Uh, the Palestinian territories or the occupied Palestinian territories consist of the Gaza Strip as well as the West Bank. As you can see very clearly from this map, while these are both Palestinian territories, they're not contiguous. And what that means on a practical level is that people in the Gaza Strip are not able to access the West Bank freely and people in the West Bank are not able to access the Gaza Strip freely. While there's over 5 million in Palestinians. Uh, you can see clearly by this map, the majority of the area is in the West Bank. Actually, 2.2 million of them live in the Gaza Strip, and it's a highly population dense region for that region and for that reason. Um, and uh, the, the, the population density, as well as the fragmentation and the blockade that's taken place over the last 15 years are some of the many reasons that we've seen a variety of barriers to care prior to October 7th and even worse since that time. Just to give you some general statistics, as I mentioned about Gaza, the population is about 2.2 million and the size is 360 miles, meters, um, sorry, square uh, that should be kilometers, and it's about 25 miles long and six miles wide. And um, one way to compare that would be that it's about the equivalent of Washington, D.C. times two, but with a population of two million people. Uh, half of the population is under 18 years of age, so 50% over 1 million children exist in this small strip of land, and about 40% of them are 14 and under, so we have a very young population, and the median age actually is about 19 the unemployment rate is about 25%, but when you stratify that by age, uh, the young population, you can see an unemployment rate as high as 70 to 80%. Um, and the infant mortality rate is about 16 deaths, deaths per 1,000 live births. And to provide context for what that means, in neighboring Israel, the infant mortality rate is about 2.3 um, deaths per 1,000 live births. So we have uh, almost a uh, almost a six-fold increase in infant mortality rate just crossing these uh, borders. Um, as I mentioned, the Gaza Strip has been blockaded since 2007 and what the implications of that are, uh, not only is there a lack of freedom of movement of people, as well as goods. The majority of goods needed to have prior to October 7th needed to come in via trucks, including medications, equipment. There is a lack of electricity. And again, prior to um, the recent events, uh, people in the Gaza Strip had on average about four hours a day of electricity off of a power grid. And the remainder of electricity was um, uh, by generators requiring fuel. There is a lack of clean water. And even the water that comes from the faucets is saline and unclean and undrinkable. And a lack of access to health care. So while there are a number of hospitals and a number of physicians, there's no access to subspecialty training. As I mentioned, there is a, a intermittent supply of medications, a lack of ability to bring in medical equipment, a lack of ability of physicians to leave for continue, continuing medical education for specific training, um, therefore leading to um, many, many gaps and deficiencies in the healthcare system. Uh, with that context, additionally, since the blockade, um, you can see that a child in the Gaza Strip, uh, this, this 
visual was created in 2021. And so uh, a child who is now 16 years old would actually be five wars old if we consider the current war that's taking place, which is the longest war at 70 days now and the most intense with the highest mortality and morbidity. And we'll get into today's numbers in just a little bit. Um, but you can see that starting in 2009, there was the first war, second one in 2012, and a third in 2014. Um, between each of those wars, there have also been heavy bombardments that have taken place. Um, so we can say effectively that since uh, the blockade in 2007, uh, children in the Gaza Strip have experienced repeated war, bombing, and violence um, throughout their entire childhood. Looking at um, what that means for our children with cancer, uh, we did perform a study uh, about six years ago, looking at the impacts of all of those barriers that we just described on especially vulnerable children, our children with cancer. So we did a study looking at children with acute leukemia. As many of you know, acute leukemia is one of the most curable types of cancer in childhood and is the most common type of cancer, acute lymphoblastic leukemia or ALL as I'll refer to it from now on. And the children in the Gaza Strip um, are treated at one department um, called in a hospital called the Rentisi Specialized Pediatric Hospital. And that's in Gaza City, which is in the Northern Gaza Strip. For those of you who have been following the news, you would know that the Northern Gaza Strip was evacuated um, effectively uh, over a month ago or about a, about a month ago at this time. And we looked at uh, what takes place when a child is diagnosed or suspected to have acute leukemia um, and what are the barriers that they face to that effective care, that over 90% chance of cure. Um, and what we discovered upon the review of uh, records of hundreds of children diagnosed with acute leukemia was that every single child in the Gaza Strip has to be referred out to receive basic diagnostics and at least some portion of their care um, over the course of their treatment. 100% of children were referred out. And what a referral looks like, and the, the child that you can see the picture there is a three-year-old boy who I had the honor and pleasure of taking care of, who was diagnosed with acute lymphoblastic leukemia um, in 2015 and had to apply for a travel permit, uh, which requires a security clearance and can take uh, up to several weeks. Family members who may travel with this child have to apply for similar, and they may have even face even longer delays in the receipt of those clearances because of uh, security issues that take place for, for adults. And so this little boy himself had to travel actually with the grandmother of his neighbors because she was the only person who was able to receive the security clearance, which is a wo woman who was unknown to him. And uh, once they received those travel permits and the uh, appropriate referral to be able to travel from the Gaza Strip to the West Bank, as I showed you in that image, that map earlier, he then went to the West Bank where he was able to get the appropriate diagnostics of flow cytometry to be able to confirm his diagnosis and begin his induction chemotherapy with the hopes of putting him into remission. And induction chemotherapy, um, as many of us know, can take a uh, takes one month or longer. And so this was a time that he was away from his family, undergoing procedures, chemotherapy, um, you know, the placement of a port, um, you know, the side effects of chemo, hair loss, nausea, vomiting, and all of the side effects that we're all well aware of with chemotherapy, again, without any family member support um, at his side. At the end of 33 days, his mother was by chance able to obtain a permit, and she was able to leave Gaza and cross to uh, be reunified with her young child, her three-year-old boy. And for those of you with children, you can imagine the anguish that a parent is facing, not being with their child who was newly diagnosed with cancer, who's had to travel abroad to receive care. Um, and I remember being in the hospital the day that her uh, that the mother had left Gaza and came to the West Bank and seeing this boy who I had seen for many days through his induction chemotherapy and had sat somber and solemn for 33 days going through all these side effects, smile for the very first time. Um, and that exact very intense moment and everything that signified behind it and the, the many challenges that this boy had to face. 
So just to review what some of these barriers are, as we mentioned previously, there's an in inconsistent access to medications that these patients and families face. There's a lack of supportive services, including intensive care for pediatrics, limited freedom of movement, uh, you know, requiring permits for children and their medical companions and any family members who are able to travel with them. And upon leaving the Gaza Strip, the many, many checkpoints that they have to get across while ill to be able to reach their referral destination hospital. Uh, the psychosocial trauma that takes place when a young child is separated from their family to receive cancer care. We're all aware of the psychosocial trauma that takes place just in the receipt of cancer care. So it's so much more, so many levels further uh, when they have to travel for that care out of the Gaza Strip um, during periods of bombardment, especially um, and across checkpoints, military checkpoints. The financial burden that this places on the Palestinian healthcare system when a child has to be referred out of the Palestinian territories to receive care, and sometimes that may be in Israel, in neighboring Jordan or Egypt, um, the Palestinian uh, authority covers the financial cost of that care. And that can be very depleting to the Ministry of Health and the healthcare system and does not allow for the investment to be able to develop healthcare services further. So it's a vicious cycle in a sense that, um, you know, the majority of funds that the Ministry of Health receives through the government budget have to then be invested into treatment abroad and cannot be invested into the actual building up of the healthcare system. And that therefore traps the healthcare system further in its inability to advance and develop and provide those services locally for those children. Um, and uh, what goes without being said is that all of the barriers that we just described and the need for referrals abroad leads to delays in treatment. And what we all know, um, those of us who are medical and those who are not, is that delays in treatment can certainly decrease our chance of remission, um, our chance of cure, and increase our chances of relapses and uh, increase morbidity and mortality. And that's what we see take place in the Gaza Strip. Because of the identification of these many barriers and the study that we um, performed uh, looking at this, um, and uh, a non-for-profit that focuses its efforts in Palestine that I volunteer with um, then built a the first and only public pediatric cancer department in the Gaza Strip. Um, in the RENTC Pediatric Specialized Hospital, I was um, honored to serve as the medical advisor on that project, and we were very proud in February of 2019 to open this department, um, and not only as a physical unit within a housed within a specialized pediatric hospital, but also to look to plug those gaps that I just described to you all in terms of having an emergency drug stock available, beginning to, to provide um, pharmacy, onco pharmacy services, uh, like a sterile hood for the preparation of chemotherapy, training of physicians and nurses and pharmacists abroad, the development of child life services, um, and many of the, the, you know, the provision of mental health services, for example, and just uh, basically attempting to look at the gaps that I just described in those barriers to care and plugging those individual gaps in an attempt to decrease the referral rates, improve the quality of care, and ultimately improve um, those morbidity and mortality rates. So that was what took place in February of 2019. And it was a very uh, proud moment, not for myself, um, but for the Palestinian people to feel that they had access to care locally within the Gaza Strip. It was a moment of dignity for them to be able to receive the care that they needed in their own, um, on their own land by their own people. We had two pediatric oncologists, very well trained, one of whom had received their training in Canada and the other one at a partner, partner institution, the King Hussein Cancer Center in Amman, Jordan. Um, and so we knew that a high level of care could be provided and that all we had to do was provide the supportive services, the continuing medical education that was necessary to, to maintain a high standard of, of care um, for these children. So we were very pleased to see um, continuing improved uh, services and outcomes from February of 2019 onward. Um, and this year in 2023 celebrated the four year anniversary of the opening of that department. And ultimately were of course devastated on October 7th. Um, and before I get into what has taken place with the war since October 7th, I would like to acknowledge of course, uh, first the events that took place with the attacks on Israel and Israeli citizens with 1200 being killed, 250 kidnapped. Um, as well as the events that have taken place in the West Bank with many Palestinian citizens in the West Bank um, since that time um, being killed through uh, airstrikes and settler attacks. Um, what we know is that since October 7th, today is day 70 of the 
uh, Israel-Gaza uh, war. And the impacts of this have been utterly devastating as we've all seen in the news and on social media. To go over some of the statistics that have been provided by the United Nations since the 14th of December, we have a total count of almost 19,000 by my last check of statistics. And we don't know what we suspect that they're, we're under counting because we have lost so many of the, um, the local services that have been able to provide death counts. So at least 18,700 was the last count as of several hours ago released by the United Nations, 19,000 killed, over 50,000. Um, are thought to be injured, and less than 1% of those injured have actually been evacuated. There's a count of about 450 people with injuries have been evacuated, whereas we are aware of at least 8,000 who require immediate medical intervention. And the reason this is really important is that this war is so different from other wars. As we mentioned, Gaza is blockaded, has been for 16 years now and continues to be. And what that means is that with the Israeli border um, on one side and the Egyptian border on another, children and and uh and adults and those who are ill and injured in the Gaza strip do not have the ability to leave um and this is a really important point that i probably should have mentioned from the very beginning but this is a un very unique situation in that sense what we know is that um in mid november uh the the israeli military uh warned repeatedly the citizens of northern Gaza to evacuate to southern Gaza. And so um, when a bombardment is about to begin, instead of being able to flee the region entirely to seek refuge in other countries, um, all that's taking place at this point is the continued internal displacement of Gazan residents. So over 30% of Gazan land has been evacuated. Um, but that is 30% uh, of the land. Some of that is very highly um, population dense, such as Gaza City in the north. And because of that, over 1.9 million people in the Gaza Strip, which is more than 85% of the population, has been displaced in the last 70 days. Additionally, basic resources, which were almost non-existent prior to the war, such as the four hours of electricity, have been entirely depleted. There's been a complete electricity block blackout since the 11th of October. There has always been a dependency on fuel for the generators that run um, hospitals and homes and provide electricity. And because of the inability to import goods and import fuel, generators have not been running for the last several weeks. Because of the um, displacement, uh, I think the number most recently was 1.3 million are in UN shelters in southern Gaza. And some of these shelters are housing more than 11 times the capacity that they should be able to house. And that has led to extreme crowding, problems with clean water, sanitation, hygiene, crowding, which have led to a variety of outbreaks, diarrheal diseases, um, and different viral infections that have, have led to outbreaks such as chickenpox. Um, and we know that this has had a, an incredible impact on all of the citizens and residents of Gaza, but particularly all of our vulnerable populations, such as uh, our cancer patients. We know also that since mid-November, there has been a siege on Gaza hospitals beginning in the Northern Gaza Strip. And so you can see this map here on the left, um, indicating hospitals in northern Gaza, such as the Rentisi Hospital, which is where our pediatric oncology department was housed, and also a pediatric hospital next to it, and the largest government um, hospital complex, El Shifa Hospital. Um, those, as well as the Indonesian and many other that you can see on this map, were all sieged by the military and um, forcibly evacuated. The majority of hospitals at this point in the Gaza Strip do not um, have the ability to admit patients or provide almost any level of medical care. Those that are admitting patients are essentially providing basic, um, you know, uh, life-saving support, um, CPR and such. But the majority have run out of any medic medicines, um, you know, consumables, the ability to provide any medical care. We've all been hearing about amputations without anesthesia, the lack of antibiotics, and the lack of ability to provide any basic medical care. That, of course, um, in our context means that there is almost no chemotherapy um, and certainly no ability to provide more advanced um, 
medical services for cancer patients. Uh, the photo in the middle that you'll see here is what took place in mid-November when the uh, this is the Rentisi Pediatric Hospital, and that was the top floor uh, where our pediatric oncology department, the beautiful one that you just saw in the previous photo, uh, was housed. And you can see that this department was shelled, and the photo to the right was the inside of the department. And so um, what took place there, as you can see here, is that prior to the war, we had our cancer department. We'd opened in 2019. We had intermittent sh chemotherapy shortages, no access to radiation therapy, uh, minimal subspecialists who are available, uh, trained staff, but no access to continuing education and the ability, inability to travel abroad. And what's taken place since October 7th is the displacement of staff due to evacuations, which led to the inability to prepare and deliver chemotherapy, eventually the shelling of the hospital, as you saw in the previous picture, and the evacuation of that hospital. Um, and that has led to the displacement of the majority of our patients dispersed throughout Central and South Gaza. Because of the lack of electricity, the lack of telecommunications, we have had poor connectivity. Prior to uh, the loss of communications, patients are at least able to text and call when their child had a fever, for example. We could try to manage them and send them to a pharmacy to get an antibiotic or to receive some sort of treatment. We were calling patients and asking them to um, come to central areas to receive oral chemotherapy as a bridge until we could find an alternative route. Um, but because of the poor connectivity and the repeated displacements with some of our patients being displaced three and four times over the last 70 days, um, we have lost connection with the majority of our patients and do not know what's taking place with them in that time. And of course, um, as I mentioned previously, the inability to travel abroad, and that is what is unique to this war, unlike so many others, is that all of our borders are closed and our patients are unable to travel to continue their care. The very small bright note is that Palestinian hospitals and our hospital in the Gaza Strip has had strong partnerships with neighboring countries and hospitals in the region. And we are grateful for hospitals in Egypt and Jordan and Turkey and the UAE who have taken in the small number of patients who have been able to be evacuated. Um, and, um, and so we know that there is a small number of patients and their families who have been uh, moved to safety and been able to continue their treatment. Anecdotally, we know that many of these children have been found to be relapsed because of the lack of care that they've had for the last 70 days and um, are requiring bone marrow transplants or more intensive chemotherapy in an attempt to get them back into remission. Uh, the challenges, in summary, prior to the war were immense. Over the last 70 days have felt almost insurmountable. What we have ahead of us are challenges beyond anything that any one group or one person um, is going to be able to overcome. It is going to take the continued partnerships of regional uh, hospitals and oncologists, NGOs and partners and global partners um, around the world to be able to take in children, continue their treatment. And once the opportunity is there to be able to rebuild Gaza and rebuild the cancer services that our children so desperately need. So we look to the day where there is a ceasefire and we look to the day that there will be an opportunity to uh, rebuild and uh, regain those services locally in the Gaza Strip. With that, I'll stop for any questions or comments. Thank you all so much.